Hello, everyone, and welcome to this live stream to discuss David Holmgren's Principles of Permaculture. Thank you, everyone, who made it today and for joining me. As we go through this, if you have any questions, thoughts, comments, concerns as we proceed, go ahead and drop those into the chat, and I will answer them to the best of my ability while we work through all this material. What I wanted to do today as part of this live stream is to look at these principles from my perspective after a decade of practicing permaculture and what I found to be useful. This isn't a replacement for a deep dive through a permaculture design course or other place where you might dig into these more deeply. Just to kind of get the conversation started after reviewing Bill Mollison's Principles of Permaculture to dig into David's and cover all of those as well. And so if there's anything that comes up that uh, you've encountered in your work with permaculture, if you have other ideas about what's fun um, or interesting about these or that we should focus on or take a deeper look at sometime in the future, if you're live with us today, go ahead and drop that in a chat. Or if you're watching this as a recording later, leave a comment and let me know. And it's something that I can address in an episode of the podcast or on a future live stream. Hey, Ms. Mills, thanks for joining us today. And though I'm going to dive into all 12 of the principles over the weeks ahead, um, likely, you know, three more of these doing three each to cover the 12 total. If you'd like to learn more, I really recommend picking up a copy of the book where these ideas are deeply enumerated by the person who, you know, developed them, David Holmgren. And that's in Permaculture, Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability. It's, it's just an amazing book. It was used as part of my permaculture design course, what my teachers use as one of our texts, and also what I've taught out of when teaching PDCs. And it's just, it's a fabulous book and one of my favorite places to go to review like the details of permaculture and you know connect with one of the originators of this idea and what he had in mind when putting them together and I also think that what David gets into in that book kind of breaks the mold sometimes about where the conversation has been as we kind of tie permaculture into some of the other regenerative practices that are out there, like organic agriculture or regenerative agriculture, alley cropping, some of these things that we as permaculture practitioners might think of as techniques, that this really goes back to ground into what, into what the practices of permaculture are and is always one worth reading. And also, if you're interested in picking up a copy of that book, you can do so at permacultureprinciples.com. They have a U.S. as well as a Australian store that you can find there at permacultureprinciples.com. Pick up a copy of David's book. Uh, while you're there, you can also explore the 12 principles of permaculture as they've worked on them and kind of enumerated them over time, uh, pulling on a lot of different ideas. I'd also like to thank my friend Richard Telford of Permaculture Principles for allowing me to use some of the graphics that you saw in the intro for this video next to Observe and Interact and the other principles. Uh, those are works that he put together and that you'll find in David's book. And he has allowed me to use those for this presentation. It was something he and I had talked about quite some years ago about doing a series on David Holmgren's Principles of Permaculture and uh, using the graphics. Um, but here's where this emerges and we get to that. And if you're new to one of the live streams, please like the video if you enjoy it. Um, you know, subscribe here on YouTube so you can get updates about what's going on for future video releases. I'm going back through the back catalog of the podcast and re-releasing those as videos on YouTube and kind of archiving them there. You're likely to see some things that haven't been out in a while uh, or that you wouldn't find in your podcast catcher in order to listen to some of these. Um, so yeah, you'll find those here on YouTube. I'm trying to release about two of those a week to get through. Well, it'll take me a while to get through all 600 or so episodes of the show, especially as new material comes out. But yeah, uh, bringing those to YouTube. So then, 
do do do. Also, if you enjoy this video or anything else that you find on YouTube or any of the podcasts that you've listened to over the years, if you've been with us for a while, uh, consider becoming a member of the Permaculture Podcast Patreon community at patreon.com slash permaculturepodcast. There you'll find weekly updates, Patreon exclusive polls that guide the direction of these live streams as well as future podcast episodes and a community discord and a lot of other things that go on just as they kind of come to mind wind up popping on there and it's a great place where you can find early information about what's going on you can find out what's happening behind the scenes um, and yeah just kind of the ongoing state of the show as it continues to move and grow over time so then let's go ahead and dig into these permaculture principles from David Holmgren. And I would like to say that as we spend some time on each of these, that I kind of take three approaches in each one. I considered at one point about looking at each of these principles from the perspective of like earth care, people care, and return of surplus, and how each of these principles kind of lead back to the ethics and produce that. But this time around, I kind of want to look at these from the view of what we can do in the landscape and in our lives, what we can do in our community from the perspective of social permaculture, and then to look at the way that we can use these principles to teach children and future generations about permaculture, some activities that we might engage them in, or just ideas about how we can... Um, introduce them to this material and have them start kind of living and thinking in a permaculture perspective. So let's go ahead then and for principle one, observe and, inter and interact. Uh, you'll also hear this sometimes referred to as beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And for me, I always like to start with this principle because it helps us to connect. And it's a reminder that we need to be in the spaces where we're working in to see what's going on, whether that is the garden or, you know, working with someone in our family, such as children, or to be out in our community and to be a part of it, because we can't make these observations just from sitting behind a desk. And there's this idea that Bill Mollison presents in the designer's manual, uh, just to paraphrase, it's something along the lines of the academic's fallacy is, um, I think, therefore I act. And that sometimes our research and putting these ideas together or on paper are not necessarily actually reflective of acting in the world. And so, you know, this principle calls for us to do so. And in our landscape, this is where we know where shadows form, where the sun shines, where water pools. As we walk around, we can see where our resources are and are available whether that's leaf litter falling from trees that we might turn into mulch, or if we're spending you know, more time outward in our community, maybe where we can find wood chips, or who our local nursery folks are, who are the people who we would buy our plants from and include into our design. And for this, I think observe and, inter and interact because there are two steps to it. It's also a reminder at times to kind of you know, go slow that observation takes time, that it's not something that we can do in a few minutes or a single walk around the backyard. It's that time that we can spend in nature and in the spaces that we're going to be designing for to get to know them very well and be able to tie together how space and the elements that we include in it are will function over time. And, you know, the, there's this idea within permaculture that we should take a year to observe a site before we design it. And I think that that applies in our social settings as well. And with the organizations that we might be a part of, that we need to take time when we do so. And that, you know, we can begin with herb observing and interacting and build up an idea of the way all these relationships work. And so you know, moving from the landscape and spending time there and take, making those observations and our design and then implementing things like a garden and the various zone models of permaculture as we plant out our food forest. When I look at our social setting, I th think about all the times that I've been on the edge of projects that failed because they didn't engage the right stakeholders or get buy-in from the right people. Uh, that 
who we are first introduced to or where we f- might um, initially see connections for who like um, the leaders are might not be what we think they are on first glance. I think about a project in Harrisburg for a community garden where the buy-in was avail- was there initially from the city, but the community leaders who would have helped bolster that project within the community weren't engaged. And so, you know, that project failed over time um, and is no longer, last I checked, is no longer there. And so I think about as we're doing this kind of work that our interaction and observation, you know, requires us to keep showing up, to be there, to be available. And that as we do that, we'll deepen our observations and get an understanding also how these different projects work and the pieces that we ourselves might want to engage in as permaculture practitioners. And that, you know, when we're ready to interact, that we can volunteer and make ourselves available with our knowledge and ideas and having spent time in the organization to be a part of it. And that we can then do the best possible from our strengths in that case. Though, you know, depending on the organization and where they're at and what their needs are, we may find that our abilities are not a good match for a given organization. And so, you know, that's okay too. Um, There may not be an opportunity available, but as we continue to show up and do the work that we can get invited in or can find another place where we can engage. And I know that though there is an urgency right now with what's happening in the world, we have so many issues going on all around us that it can be hard to want to go slow, to show up, you know, and take the time to build those relationships with the landscape or with the people around us. But it's vital to the practice of permaculture to take that time and, you know, work slowly and to get to know people see what their needs are, and to find the best ways that we can be of service to their work, not just to our own. And then with children, I think that as we go about our day, we can check in with them periodically. Ask them what they can see, smell, hear, taste, and feel. Ask them what they're feeling and what they are thinking about. You know, what is their emotional interaction with what is occurring around them? And get to know them as part of our observations, getting to know them inside and out and getting to bring their whole person to what it is that we are doing um, with our permaculture practices. And, you know, as we get them to engage with their senses and their thoughts and their emotional feelings, that we can visit this kind of idea wherever we are any time of day. Um you know, whether that's in the home or when we're out doing something as we're, you know, driving to school uh, or an event to do these kinds of periodic check-ins and and see the ways that their perspective of the world changes over time and over space. And then, you know, when we revisit a place that we can ask if they notice that there's anything different since the last time that we were there. And then, you know, from those observational perspectives for our interaction, I really just like to include children in every day of our lives, that as people who care about them, as people who are active in their lives, to just make them a part of what we're doing, have them help with what we're working on, whether that's, you know, in the gardens we're planting out, you know, to bring in um, or help fold and put away laundry, or if there's an event that is welcoming to children and families, and I know that not all are, so that's something important to consider as we're looking at it to take them to our trainings, to festivals and workshops. And that over time, if we make them a part of all of this, these become a part of them as well. And it, you know, I wish that I had had a permaculture education when I was a child because I look back at all of the influences that have really settled into making me who I am today. And that I've had to integrate permaculture into my life rather than being being a, a natural part of this process over the years. Now, before we move on to principle two, is are there any questions uh, that you'd like to drop into the chat for me to address for this before we move on? And it is one, feel free, you know, 
throughout this, go ahead and drop anything in. I am monitoring uh, what's going on over there and can gladly uh, hop into anything that you might have in mind as we go through this today. All right, and then I will revisit that and we'll move on to principle two, catch and store energy. Catch and store energy is sometimes referred, you'll also hear as we make hay while the sun shines. And for me, I think about how when we create an abundance with permaculture, there's a great deal that we can harvest and develop from sites, but at the same time, we never know when we may lose access to a resource or find that something is in limited supply. So when we have the opportunity, we should set aside what we can to ensure that we and our design can thrive deeply and vibrantly, whatever we encounter. And so, you know, I think in our landscape that we plant some extra plants so that some can go to seed. That we can then um, save those seeds for the next season. We can put away a bit more than we might need from our garden, whether it's... Uh, yeah, And in putting away that seed that we put away a bit more than we might need in any given year for our garden, farm, or homestead. That as permaculture practitioners, as we dig into these ideas that we build soil to increase the water holding, water holding capacity so we can store water inexpensively in the ground rather than having to build cisterns or water tanks. Yet, those are something that we can rely on, you know, if we have long periods of time in the area where we live that we don't have access to rainfall, that we have these other strategies and techniques that we can use to keep and have things like water available and on hand. You know, we have that idea of not leaving soil bare, and so we can put a mulch on it to protect the soil and allow water to infiltrate and not evaporate. And all of these different techniques that we can apply in different areas throughout our design space in order to capture water and other resources, um, you know, different nutrients by using compost and recycling of materials in that way from our garden, from our kitchen, and returning them so that they can be available for later use. You know, we move resources through the land when they're available, like fall leaf litter to our garden beds so that they can break down and become nutrients for the following year. And taking everything that we can and developing kind of this redundancy within the system as we make use of what is available when it is available, even if it doesn't necessarily fit, you know, where we are at any given moment. And so, you know, when it comes to our food, planting things that we can store for winter or storm seasons when we're not able to grow, we have the ability through greenhouses and um, creating sheltered growing that we can extend our harvest through the year if that's a necessity um, or something that is interesting or vital to our design and design work. Um, you know, we just have all of these different ways that we can bring this together so that we can store what we need for later. You know, in our home, learning how to preserve through fermentation or drying so that we can save more delicate foods throughout the year and keep a variety of foods available in our diet and have these different flavors, even though it is a different time. Um, you know, also using these so that we can increase our resiliency by having items stored, which I'll get into a bit more, you know, um, here in a minute, but I find that it's super important in our lives and in our homes to be able to put things aside because it's something that we can do regardless of where we live, whether we live in a city, apartment, or a rural farmstead, we can create redundancy um, and to have spares and backups on hand of what we use regularly every day. You know, with what we may have seen with pandemic buying, refilling our toilet paper when there's still a couple of rolls left in the closet. Uh, working with a doctor to make sure that we have a month of medication on hand at all times, you know, in to try to limit the impacts of disruptions on our lives. Um, it allows us to thrive as human beings by putting these kinds of systems in place. Um, you know, I really think deeply about keeping some extra food on hand 
so that we have something we actually enjoy eating in case there is some kind of a uh, disaster which for you know if we're going to talk about designing for disasters when it comes to permaculture practices you know putting something aside for ourselves so that we can get through that whether that's three days worth of food and water a week's um, you know having copies of our documents and things that we might need if we have to leave the place where we are though many of us I aren't likely with where we live to be refugees in a matter of days weeks or months you know if we look at the state of the world and the climate crisis continues to develop there is a possibility that something like that could occur and so having that kind of stuff available or again like I say designing for disasters you know power outages and normal things that happen every day extra batteries recharging equipment for flashlights and cell phones things like that uh, but deciding what you need to have on hand in this way to store resources that you and your family or loved ones may need I go back to that uh, personal self-assessment what we discussed in the previous live stream on doing a needs and yields assessment that if we create that kind of assessment for ourselves we can have a clear understanding of, of exactly what our needs are and be able to continue to design our life using permaculture and these principles if this is something that you'd like me to do a podcast episode or a live stream on this idea of uh, principle two, catch and store energy and the way that that relates to personal preparedness and disaster or uh, crisis response, uh, leave a comment. Let me know uh, something that I did quite a bit when I first came into permaculture and I could dig into that kind of conversation um, pretty deeply if you would like to. But this principle is also where I take, I like to take a skills gate, a skills based approach to a lot of my planning and preparation. Um, you know, not only about things like putting food aside, but learning what to forage in my area. Get, and, you know, knowing different ways to capture clean and prepare water for plant, animal, and human use. You know, in addition to having an idea of how to process those things, along with those ideas, knowing where the various sources are in my area. You know, where are there gutters that run off into the street? Where are there waterways that nearby um, here in the Northern Virginia, D.C. area? And, you know, continuing to work on building these skills over time creates a lot of flexibility and greater resilience for ourselves and allows us to be less reliant on the technology of civilization to see our most basic needs met. And that, you know... With the more skills we have, the less stuff that we need. And so I see, just see that as a part of our long-term preparedness for what may uh, develop in the future. And getting all of this together um, for those of us who are permaculture practitioners and planning for the future. And what goes with that for me is also socially building out our networks. Um, you know, when it comes to observing and interacting, getting involved. Whether we're interested in doing like nonprofit um, work where we want to go and volunteer with an organization and really get involved with that way, or really if it's just, you know, if we have a hobby where people meet regularly, going and spending time with them, you know, attending those kinds of events. When it comes to charities or social events, a lot of times, you know, there are fundraisers and other things you can go to, dinners and dances and, um, you know, different kinds of rummage sales and all these different places where members of community come together you know being active in your church or with a church group if you are so inclined um you know even if it isn't necessarily on the religious side but being active with part of the like social or volunteer side of things and i just kind of like look for all of those places where we can be a part of our local community and be known to the people who are around us um, even, you know, if we're not in a place where we can go to these kinds of events or attend things like this physically, what are, if you're on like LinkedIn or Facebook, you know, are there groups that you're a part of that have virtual socials? I just found one recently that's uh, on LinkedIn that's a bunch of different folks from like the regenerative and permaculture space where they kind of do mixers um, a couple of times a month where you hop on. Um, you know, we do some rounds of introductions, then you get some one-on-one -on -one time to talk to each other um, and kind of really develop those relationships. And it's where I just find that, 
you know, as we do that, it deepens the number of connections that we have around us. Um, S, I apologize how to pronounce that, S Cree? Uh, when you say that this important is the most important for you, are you meaning uh, catch and store energy, principle two? I apologize, I didn't see when your comment came through. Um, but yeah, as we like check in on our community and we are a part of it and we deepen those relationships, you know, if we have a good relationship with our family, we can check in with them regularly. Even if we're separated by thousands of miles, that quick phone call or a text message. The same things with our friends. If there's somebody who you can think of who you haven't seen in a while or talked to, send them a quick message and just remind them that you're thinking about them. Because again, it helps us maintain our relationships and, you know, store social energy when it's available to us. And, you know, kind of builds up that piggy bank for those times when we're not as, um, when we're not necessarily as resilient, we have other things that we can fall back on. Um, and yeah, I feel that those social connections are a big part of that. Um, and just, I'm always looking for ways to be involved or get involved or spend time with people so that we re are, you know, in their thoughts and r our humanity remains an active part of our relationship. Um, not to dive too far deeply into it, but like there's this idea of Dunbar's number and the number of, of people who we can like know and recognize as other human beings. And so, uh, and form like our sense of community and who we know, uh, which I really recommend like reading up on Dunbar's number because it deals a lot with many of, I think our social issues um, deeply down. We're still, you know, part of those like smaller cultural pieces. So, um, the group that I recommended, Jennifer, about social mixers is on LinkedIn. Um, I can get that information to you if you follow me on LinkedIn uh, or if you want to shoot me a quick email show at the permaculturepodcast.com. I can uh, get that information to you. Yeah, and Stefan, I, I think that principle two is one that we think about very often in our conversation about design in the landscape, but it's and it's super important about how we meet those needs there because that's how we're going to feed ourselves, um, which also gets into principle three, but also the way that that spins out into the rest of our lives and the security that that creates for us. There's this, um, one of my favorite books that I refer back to when I think about permaculture practices is uh, Robert Rodale's Save Three Lives. I don't remember if it's still in print. I was given a copy by somebody who attended a Rodale event and I, yeah, I don't remember where all that comes from, but in there he talks about how like the practices that he was seeing around the world, many of the community practices don't look like agriculture, they don't look like farming. So when disasters strike, those places are, are usually are like left alone um, or continue in perpetuity. And so like, how can we create that kind of resilience through our practices and looking at permaculture and a lot of what we do, the way that it creates systems that aren't necessarily ones that um, look like they're um, easy to exploit. And I don't, <laughs> and in saying that I don't want to, to sound super negative about this because permaculture creates abundance as well. And so it is like, what is the surplus that comes out of what we're doing and um, the way that we can save and store that for later and but from there when it comes to this the final point that i wanted to make when it comes to like the educating future generations is with children i look at ways that we can introduce them to the idea of saving and talking about putting something aside for the future in the garden having them engaged in the act of saving seeds when we put out a couple of extra plants you know talking with them about why it's important that we don't harvest them for our human use but we need to let them stay on the vine or on the plant a little bit longer because those are going to be the seeds for those that we plant in the future. Um, you know, and also like, again, when we are bringing in food for the seasons where it's not going to be readily available, having them be engaged in helping us with the harvest and with curing things like onions and garlic or potatoes for winter. 
And then also like in the home, having them help us with the food that we're storing. Um, you know, depending on their age, whether they are, can help operate the canner or if they're going to just help us, you know, label the jars, label the jar lids or, you know, put the date on the bag while we're um, preparing all of this. And yeah. And, you know, if we have children, we give them an allowance, having a piggy bank where we ask them to save some of that and, you know, why we put that away. And again, doing everything that we can to model the importance of storing and saving things away for the future. So then uh, I'm going to take a drink here, as I did with principle one. If you have any questions, thoughts, or suggestions that you'd like to drop into the chat uh, for me to address here uh, before we move on, please go ahead and do that. And then we will get ready for the last of the principles that we're going to cover today. Principle three, obtain a yield. All right, principle three, obtain a yield, which you also find referred to as you can't work on an empty stomach. And for me, you know, kind of this theme of making sure that we meet our needs, we need to be able to feed ourselves. And so we have to ensure that we have food on hand. If we can grow fruit, if we can grow food and have the space to plant it, then it's planting enough that we don't lose everything if a storm or insects come through and destroy part of our harvest. If we're not in a place to grow, using the resources we do have in order to create a surplus that we can store. Um, because, because so many people live in cities these days, it's where a lot of my thought goes, is around like the city, the urban, the peri-urban kind of landscape. And one of my favorite books about that is Toby Hemingway's Permaculture City. And he talks a lot about the resources that we do use by being further away from our community centers, as well as, you know, making sure that we're, we're doing what we are best capable of when, it, when we're considering the systems that we're going to develop and how we develop them and the way that that reflects on the zone model and the way that we can, you know, secure the different kinds of yields, both from our own production personally, whether, as I say, that is growing food or using an income that we earn to purchase those resources or, you know, in some way trade with other people, but to focus then on our given strengths. And so if we are growing, good at growing food, grow food. If we have the ability to grow food, grow food. Uh, but if that's something that you're not great at, then, you know, don't make that your priority. Make your priority looking at other ways that you can obtain yields from what it is that you already do. And in doing so, also considering that yields aren't just physical, tangible outcomes, so that there are ways that we can create other yields in our systems. Again, as I say about relationships, relationships reflect yields. Being able to put out plants that invite pollinators in and supporting those pollinators are a yield, even if the pollinators that come in are not ones that directly pollinate our particular plants in our garden but we do create relationships there and we create yields that are beyond the ones that we might normally think of. And so, you know, when we think about yields and that the yields of a system are theoretically unlimited, you know, hearkening back to Bill Mollison's permaculture principles, you know, that we can design for beauty or the creation of a space that is for joyful reflection or allows us to go to and to relax that we can arrange our garden and our, you know, zone one and zone two around a way that we can increase our physical activity. We can locate our gardens where others can see them and include signs to educate others about the plants that are there. You know, why have we planted something and improve, increase the knowledge of those folks who are around us. And again, look for different ways to continue to increase the yields um, looking at both the human, the other human, and elsewhere within our system and our community. Um, yeah, and like, you know, if we plant a garden in our front yard and we have neighbors who are walking by, talking with them about why the garden is there and what the purpose, what purpose it serves for us as the um, land users, landowners, 
or for people within the community. And, you know, I also think about like pick your own spaces where you can go and harvest berries and things like that, that we might create our own kind of like neighborhood uh, visitor's bed and create an invitation for others to come and pick what they like from that garden. Um, if we're involved in a, in a local community group and we know some of our neighbors asking them, hey, I'm looking at putting this kind of bed in place and, you know, we have like little libraries and little food banks. Well, what about creating a little garden? for folks. Um, and in our communities, again, I think about relationship building and how we can increase the yields for everyone involved in those organizations and relationships. Um, you know, for those of us who shop at farmers markets, getting to know our farmers. So if they have a bumper crop of something that we can buy a bushel at a discount rather than a few quarts at a time, which then allows us to, um, you know, go back to principle two and store more energy and to do so more effectively with the resources that we have available to us. Um, or, you know, if we're people who process a lot of food, you know, offering to buy damaged product produce because we will be able to take that home and then create secondary products like salsa from tomatoes and onions and peppers or applesauce from apples. Um, and I found that if you engage in those conversations, you can find also like what farmers have a lot of or different places where they sell things um, and very often are interested in ways that we can that they, that they can move those resources around again with organizations how can the mission of the group reach more people and increase the impact how can we invite more people into what we're doing to expand the reach of our work i think back to when we were creating a community garden at a boys and girls club some years ago and that, you know, we would have volunteer days and we'd reach out to a bunch of folks we knew in the permaculture and related communities and have them come out and help us do a lot of building and development. But we would also, with the permission of the executive director, work with the children who were at the club as well as the volunteers to come out and spend time with us while we were doing this. You know, they didn't need to lend their labor to the cause, but what I'll, while I was digging a hole for a tree, talking with them about you know why the hole was the size that it was how i was going to lay the roots of the of the tree out um, sitting there with them and showing them how the tools are used um, if i was if we had a limb that was broken if i was going to trim that back um, show them you know the the right the the best place to make that cut or um, you know using a pocket saw to trim a piece of root off that had bro been broken and then you know then at the end of the day, those kids would go and they'd grab their parents and talk with them about how they had this experience in the garden at the club. And some of those parents came and talked with us as well. And just, yeah, looking at ways that we can um, be of service without needing to ask people to do, you know, all of like the, the fundraising and the giving and a lot of the things that I find that like NGOs and nonprofits are doing. It seems like they're always fundraising, but it's how do we increase the outreach and the mission um, of organizations or just, you know, I think about some of the like fraternities and things that exist and these organizations that are, that are aging and how can they bring in newer members to be a part of that? And as permaculture practitioners, anything that we might develop, how can we make that more accessible and more inviting to people as well through our work and over time, uh, with children in our, in our garden, again, have them help us plant out a few extra of each of our plants and so that we can increase a yield beyond just our subsistence. We can ask them to imagine the yields of a plant or animal and work with that idea of like the needs and yields assessment and have them do that yield side of the assessment to engage their imagination and get them thinking about what yields are and what they reflect in what it is that we're doing to talk about the non-tangible and non-material yields from things such that such as the joy of a sudden gift um like of art i think about my cho all my children's fridge art from when they were younger and the way that you know that kind of sparks joy to be able to bring that into my home and put it on the fridge and i've got you know folders from years ago uh collecting a lot of this because it still brings me joy and the way that that's an important part of this work um, you know, and talk with them about the 
importance of like looking for these kinds of yields and the way that that can help us be good stewards remembering that when we pick up a stone to look for amphibians that it's important to turn it back over because of the way that the yield, one of the yields of that stone is as a home for those creatures and continue to build up their understanding of, of all of the ways that this interrelates so ah, yeah and so that's kind of what I had prepared today when it comes to these three principles of permaculture and the pieces that I continually turn over in my mind when I look at the landscape, our society, and future generations. And this is the approach that I'll be taking in our conversations moving forward on these principles. As I say, if there's anything that came up in this that you agree with, disagree with, you feel is really important or not, feel free to leave a comment. Um, let me know where this was useful or not, again, so that I, these can be improved over time. Um, if you have any questions, if again, if you're in the chat and want to drop those in there before we end for the day, feel free to go ahead and share those. Um, if you're watching this as a recording, leave a comment, let me know about anything that you'd like me to revisit or dive in a bit deeper. As always, permaculture is a broad practice. There are numerous different ways that we can engage with creating the world that we want to live in to make a world of abundance for all life, human and other than human. And so the way that this manifests is very unique to each of us. And so this is the perspective that I have. But there are so many different ways that we can approach this and dig really deeply into any given one of them and the way that is, it is reflective of the practice of permaculture where we are specific to our needs. So yeah, if there's anything else that you ever need or want, feel free to drop me a line on um, the podcast's email, show at the permaculturepodcast.com. Drop me a text message if you'd like, 717-827-6266. Um, a lot of times that's probably the easiest and fastest way to get a hold of me. You can find me on social media, Twitter at Permaculture Pod, Instagram Permaculture Podcast. I share announcements of these whenever they go up and go out uh, for additional live streams. Uh, as I say, the community, the Patreon community is also a place where I spend a lot of time as well. So if there's anything that you need um, or want, feel free to join that community. As I say, there's a lot of back behind the scene stuff going on there so you can find out what's going on about like the future of the show when new episodes are coming out what new episodes are going to be and things like that um the next live stream will be on tuesday i'm going to hop on at 3 p.m eastern uh just to kind of talk about some of the books that have come in from publishers lately that i've really enjoyed and you know we can discuss whether or not there's something that you should pick up um ask any questions what you might have I know that that's in the afternoon, so isn't great for everyone. Um, but just trying some different times because as you know, those of you in the chat are saying, uh, Felipe, you're in Brazil. Um, people, you know, come to this from all over the world. So I want to make these kinds of conversations accessible live so people can join in. Uh, but yeah, 3 p.m. Eastern, I think that's 7 p.m. then GMT. Um, 12 noon on the West Coast uh, for anybody who wants to hop on. So yeah, but thank you all who came in and joined today. Thank you for your comments and being part of this. It's always a good time. I'm really enjoying these. So if there's anything that you'd like to see um, or if there's an ideal day and time that works for your schedule that I can host one of these because you'd like to hop on and be a part of it, let me know. Um, and then, yeah, once we hit the fall, I think I'll be able to do these more regularly on the weekends. Of course, with summertime, there's all the errands and running. Um, but yeah, I'll let you know when the next one of these will be on the weekend soon. So yeah, thank you everybody. Take care and all my best.